lot of people are entrepreneurs, and, and as you know, as entrepreneurs, we always have this big fight against people who are always saying it's impossible. It's impossible to build their dreams. And that's what we want to address today. Um, I will start with education. Can you, and we're trying to make you part of this conversation. Can you raise your hand if you um, had a loan for your study? Can you just raise your hand, some of you? Yes, some of you. Um, and a few years back, I realized that it was super hard for a lot of different people to get those loans for a, a serious, various of, of, of reasons. And we built something called Infinite Infinite. You understand in a minute is how can we just fix some issues about you know, student loans? Um, let's take that I will finance a student, the best, the best student from his high school, wherever this student you know, works, best student. And you say, starting now, you can go to the best school. Because if we see the world of today, if you don't have the parents with money, it will be almost impossible to get to the top schools. And we know that. But I know this for years. But I always got answers from people saying, it's impossible to change the student loans. It's, it's not working. You have scholarship or you don't have scholarship. And we build something new. The issue, you understand it pretty well. But how we fix that? You start just, you know, or I or you, we start financing this student, the best one. We said, starting from now, you will get the student loan, but the interest-free loan with no interest and no guarantee attached. No banks, even Goldman Sachs, can do this. Interest-free loan, why? Because maybe you know this, but three religions out of five cannot accept interest attached to a loan. So if you follow religions, it's almost impossible. If you are a single mom, if your mom is a single mom, it's impossible that the, the bank will just give you this loan. Net-net will send those kids, the best ones, to the best schools around the world. What is happening at the end of it? They, get, they will get the diploma, and Goldman Sachs will hire them. McKinsey, you name them. And then they have to pay back. But they won't pay back to me or to you as a donor. They will pay back to an evergreen fund. Then then we'll finance the next student. So we have just reinvented the Ponzi scheme. You remember the Ponzi scheme? <laughs> but the positive one. We start something, and those kids suddenly are not only beneficiaries, they become donors. They become philanthropists themselves. Not at 45 when they will get enough money, but at 22, 24. So this is a start. And the start on the education system, I think people three years ago, we started everything three years ago with this startup. It's an ed tech with social one called Infinite, with people saying it's impossible to change something. And I'm super lucky to be on stage today, but also to be with those two amazing entrepreneurs. And I will start with you, Julie, because this is an education system. Can you tell us you are impossible in the world of food and cosmetics? Well, so we're bounding on this impossible thing. When we started UK in 2016, we had this guy, um, very famous in the food tech in, in France, and he told us, you have a great idea, but the scan is, scanning products is a very bad idea. Um, and you should implement the project in a different way because people will never scan product. They will never spend time scanning product in a supermarket. And our instinct was that people were going, were going to, to scan because it, it's fun. And so we did not listen to him. And today, every second in the world, 65 products are scanned on the app. Um, and so, yes, we didn't listen to that man that said that was impossible. And so it was I, not a woman, that's what you're saying? No, it was a man, okay, because let's men put this way, okay. like uh, giving advice even if we don't ask. Uh, so he gave me this advice, and I didn't listen to him. But he was like famous in the food tech, so I could have been, I had been impacted, but I, am, I had my instinct saying, no, I, I was really believing in the product. And well, um, so yes, today Yuka has 60 million users um, in 12 different countries. And um, maybe going back to the mission of Yuka, um, Yuka has um, a twofold mission. The first one is obviously on consumers. Our objective is to help people make better choices for their health. 
uh, by having access to more transparent information about the composition of the products they buy. But there is a second level to our mission. Um, it's to have an impact on manufacturers and so that all these consumers, by making different choices, can push manufacturers to improve what's in their product. And that's what happened in, in France and in Europe. Uh, we are contacted daily in, in France and in Europe by manufacturers who are reformulating their products to achieve better ratings on Nuka. We even are contacted by manufacturers before launching new products because they want to check what's going to be the rating on, on Nuka. And in France, for instance, there is this French retailer, Intermarché, uh, which reformulated 900 products by removing 142 additives to achieve better ratings on Yuka. That's now what we are trying to replicate here in the US. In the US, we have 16 million users. It's, it's good, but it's not enough for the moment to start having an impact on manufacturers, and that's really what we are trying to do here. We have a first impact on manufacturers, but now we are trying to get this second level uh, impact uh, on, on manufacturers. So, and, and Julie just moved moved to the US a year ago, so pushing hard just the, uh, the UK just team here in, in the US. Yeah. Talking about food and cosmetics, uh, now it's, it's more about just the fashion, same. I think when I grew up in the world where fashion and um, something in a positive was just impossible, just how do you start everything thinking that you can do, build something way, 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 for, for way, way, way different than, uh, than just the Victoria's Secret of the world? Um. So I'm, I'm the founder of a company called Adormi, which today is probably one of the largest brand of uh, lingerie in the US. And when we, when we started uh, a bit over 10 years ago, we were facing a world where fashion image was all about perfection, uh, beauty perfection, body perfection. And um, it just felt that it didn't really resonate with how women felt. And so we started, back in the days, the, the very first brand that would cater to everyone, every size, and be inclusive of every type of um, body shape. Um, it was a technical challenge, first of all, because no one brand had taken the challenge of dealing with so many SKUs. Um, a bra comes with about 80 different SKUs, uh, just for one type of bra. So it, there is a technical challenge, it was also a marketing challenge, and I think the impossible thing to do was to have society accept that even wearing lingerie, you could have women of all body types uh, be promoted um, in nationwide advertising campaign. And as we did so, uh, we started to actually have a very positive echo from the customer side, and as we were pushing more and more to do it, we saw that we were not the only one who wanted the change, and somehow the fashion industry started to pivot a little more toward inclusivity every year. Um, the pinnacle of it was when ultimately Victoria's Secret, which is the very one brand that always promoted body perfection, ended up recognizing that Adore Me, the small company we had built, a few years earlier, had created a dent in the industry and ended up purchasing the company in order to acquire that authenticity which they couldn't really bring to the market. And just two days ago, for the ones who look at fashion or social media in general, the Victoria's Secret show came back and for the first time you could see women of all age, ranging from 17 up to 58 on a runway, all size, uh, from very skinny to much bigger, all ethnicity, and finally, you could see comments on social saying, oh my God, my daughter won't have to believe that she should be something that is that perfection anymore. We can live in a country where the marketing image is very relatable. And so, ultimately, that's the change we've brought, and now we're trying to do the same with sustainability. So, and you're, you're very humble. Um, can you just give us the price of the acquisition? Um, between half a billion and a billion dollar. So, it's... Uh...
Why, and we know this, why is, is, is important to clap is not because it's a big number. I think it's, it's, it's important a number. But the number proves something. And if you text something and the issue was a different angle, and he took this issue, he didn't text just a 45 degree or a 90 degree angle difference at the time. But even a few degrees at the time, 10 years down the, down the path, down the road, and at just a very different location. Um, and I'm saying it and I should thank you because I'm, I'm one of the shoulder. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm, I'm a lucky shoulder. Um, but the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm putting it this way, nine years ago, um, I, when I started another organization called Epic, in the same year, I built an, an, an organization called Bleas. Bleas is a, it's a venture firm. But uh, you good like this? Mm -hmm. like this? Okay. <laughs> we discussed before if we were just standing up or not before being on stage, but I like the way you, you cross your legs. Um, <laughs> So the, um, and the, the, the firm is an investment firm, yes. But the world I grew up, it's a world where just positive finance was an oxymoron. And I'm happy to say it here at Goldman Sachs. Um, I can you put together those two terms. The beauty of what we see now and more and more is, do, is doable. We see more and more people believing in finance because that's really just something important. But how can we balance this with something positive? And we see more and more businesses like those two, who are just, yes, being successful, 16 million just in the US, 16 million in the world, or just the one for Morgan. Um, I would take one, and one as an example in the, in, in the food industry. Have you ever heard about Too Good To Go? Do you know this app, Too Good To Go? Can you raise your hand a lot of, lot of people? Oh, wow, massive. Um, but Too Good To Go, if you look at the numbers, it's also very interesting. Too Good To Go, they're making last year $150 million of revenues. They're cash positive. It's a B Corp, it's led by a woman. That's something that's for sure we will love. And do you know where it has been launched at the very start? Which country, some of you? No. Guys. Denmark. In France. Denmark. Denmark. So Denmark. So that's also a proof. We can build innovation. We can start something from zero. Not only, and even if I love New York or San Francisco, is doable. Talking about those great businesses, um, I just mentioned B Corp. B Corp is a good way to show something to the external world. So Bleece, my investment firm, is a B Corp and the first B Corp investment firm. But it's interesting that the three of us, beside a lot of different things, were connected through B Corp. So, uh, can you mention those values in this mission for you, Julie? Yeah, so <clears throat> we have been certified B Corp six months ago, which is a really huge recognition for all the efforts we put in having um, a really sustainable and, and a business with values. Um, in France, we have uh, also the Société à Mission, um, and we really define ourselves as a mission-driven company so what does it mean for us to be a mission-driven company? It means that we put impact first before money. And money is a means to achieve a positive impact in the world, but it's not an end in itself. And I think that's the main difference with a classic company where money is just the end in itself. Um, and um, I really believe that the world is not divided between companies just seeking for profit and nonprofits that work for the common good, but, but they live from donations and, and grants. I really think that there is a third way with impact-driven companies that create value. People are paying for products, services, but at the same time, we have a positive impact in the world. And I'm really proud to have a profitable business. Our business model is profitable, um, but at the same time, we are having a positive impact on consumers, on manufacturers, and I really believe in this third way with impact-driven companies that are like too good to go, uh, it's, it's the same. Um, there are more and more companies uh, like that, and I'm very proud to, to show that it's possible uh, to have a mission-driven company and be profitable. So the first, the first time I met just Julie was six years ago. And I remember the conversation we had, she mentioned just investors and, and the way she will treat investors. And we need money, not much. But the investors should know that they will never see their money back. Meaning that 
the, the goal is, was to find investors that will be part of this long-term mission, not this short-term saying, in five years, I want you to find my money back. It's really, how can we build together something long-term? And I think was very special and very unique, very unique, I think, in terms of entrepreneurship. So thank you, Julie, for this. Um, B Corp, when? It was long B Corp years It's back. been a while. We were the very first um, lingerie company to become B Corp uh, in the world. That was about three years ago. And um, for us, it was a bit like in the inclusivity game. We felt fashion is a very polluting industry. And it was, at the time, somehow easy to be a sustainable brand if you price your product at a very expensive price. Uh, Patagonia is a great example. VC in the room should know. And, uh, and then when you look at the fashion which is affordable, the Zara, the H&M of the world, no one would really manage to make fashion sustainable. So what we felt is if when we sell at our very affordable price, we sell a bra for on average $29, um, we can make it sustainable. Not only will do good for our customer base, but that's, that's a very small part of the equation. We want to show that it is actually possible to make fashion be sustainable while not having any heat on your bottom line. Uh, and it's a very thin margin for us given the price of the product. And so we have completely reimagined the whole supply chain from the very first sourcing of the material to the way we manufacture it, to the way we transport it, to the way we sell it, so that as of today, 85% um, of everything we do uh, is sustainable and carbon neutral. We should be at 100% within a year and a half. While five, six years ago, we were at zero. So it was a whole transformation of the company from being traditionally fashion polluting to today almost having no carbon footprint. And so we did this without any uh, damage on the margin, which is probably the most interesting. And so now we are rolling out this with Victoria's Secret, which is one of the biggest retailers in the world. And we want to show competition or fashion in general that it can be done and ultimately create a real change, which is not really going to happen inside the company, but just by showing the way to others. And so hopefully we are getting there and this is something that we thought would be next to impossible to do a few years ago and which now is our daily bread and butter. So that's almost the end. No, no Q&A, but I, I, I would just um, end this session by just thanking just all the entrepreneurs. And I think it's, uh, it's, uh, we have a bunch of entrepreneurs here, but the one who is putting everything together is Benoit Buridon. So I think it's always good to, to yeah, so I think you can just uh, give a big round of applause. Um, but Geraldine, Paul, just the, all the team, all the wonderful team, if you have, if you have you know, 30 seconds. And I also want you to talk again about other entrepreneurs. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's, it's, no, it, I can see this here. This guy, just Mathieu, I think, is over there from TKO. Um, another guy who said, you know, we believe that it was impossible just to, to make things. And if you remember this phrase from Mark Twain, he said something interesting for all the entrepreneurs in this place. They didn't know it was impossible. That's why they did it. And I think that's what just really reunite us. If we start thinking and, and, and overthinking what people will always tell us, we'll never do anything. That's real for us, it's real for our kids. We want this world to be different. It has to be different, it will be on us, no one else. Believe it's possible and we need to believe in a dream. So thank you for this.